Listen, church, if you were here last week and I saw many of your hands, we are now in part two, and uh, this message uh, is one that is not for the faint of heart. In fact, after all three messages last week, we had more people get up and walk out of the message while it was going than any message that we've had in over 10 years' time. People just couldn't cope with what was being presented. And if you were not here, uh, you need to go online and check it out. I think there's something like 200,000 plus viewers right now that, are, that have looked at it. Uh, we interrupted the Book of Romans to bring you a report from the United States Congress uh, regarding the events uh, that have been taking place in and around the United States. And uh, we let those who were testifying uh, by us uh, or at a special uh, congressional meeting to be put on the screens, and that rattled people enough. And then when I got into the Bible and talked about what Jesus said about last day's deception, they couldn't handle it. They just couldn't handle it. Church, you're going to be challenged again today. I trust, I trust the, the rest of you are, are fit to go through round two of this, and that is that the Bible is 100% true. It's never been wrong. The Bible's never been wrong. If the Bible would have been wrong, it, it would be the number one post on every page of the world that you can't trust the Bible because it's wrong. The truth of the matter is, the Bible is 100% true. Time has proven it to be true. And as you observe it, you can't get away from it that the Bible is a message system that has been written to us by God that is outside of our time, outside of material universe, and has been delivered to us, the Bible says, by God through man, throughout the ages. 66 books, 40 different authors, spanning the time of nearly 2,000 years, from Genesis to Revelation. It's quite amazing. And in that genre, we looked at our first argument of in the days of deception. Notice how I spell days, D-A-Z-E like you just got slapped upside the head, and you can see stars going around your head, uh, like that kind of daze. Deception causes a daze. Deception causes fear. Deception causes confusion. Deception causes souls to be stolen from the grace of God and to be bound by the powers of Satan. The Bible is very clear about the origins of deception. But we looked at this in the days of deception. We, we looked last time at what does every Christ follower know for sure. There are things, hallelujah, right, that we can know for sure in the word of God. And that is that the Bible tells us, number one, of the things that have happened in the past. History. Number two, the Bible tells us what's happening now regarding current events. And third, the Bible tells us about what's going to happen in the future. I'm going to ask you to write these down, if you would, because as we consider the warning signs and the warning exhortations to not be deceived, every one of us want to make sure that we are prepared for what is in our world right now and for what is coming. Number one, write this down, if you would, Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9, Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. God says, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Somebody say amen to that. I love the way God brags. I mean that in a good way, in a holy way. When God boasts, this is how we boast, okay? God says, I know the future before it ever happens, and I can learn nothing because I dwell outside of your time and out of your world, and I'm, in fact, I've inserted myself into your world via the Bible. Again, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. 2 Peter 1, 19 says, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed. The prophetic word is God's prophetic word. Don't let somebody come up and tell you, I have a prophecy for you, brother. Let me speak it over your life. Hey, listen, tell them to just go somewhere because you have the Bible. 
And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to take heed to as the light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Translation, you can't make stuff up. No matter how you feel, you can't make it up. Verse 21, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What an awesome blessing that is. The Spirit of God has spoken the Bible. And again, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, just the front end of that verse, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The word inspiration of God means that all the Scriptures have been breathed out by God. You say, yeah, but I thought you said men wrote it. Yeah, that's the amazing thing. God possessed these men to write the scriptures. And the Bible also says in another place that the prophets wrote down these things that God had said and they themselves did not understand what it was they were writing. Wow, that's going to come into play as we get into the study more and more. And again, one more time here on this one. Revelation 1, verse 12. Revelation 1, 12. John says, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like uh, fine brass as if refined in a furnace. Have you ever seen brass glowing from the heat, from the fire? And his voice as the sound of many waters. Verse 16, he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Isn't this freaky? This is Jesus. This just kind of blows your mind, don't you? Because you think of the Newport Beach Jesus wearing a robe. He has Hirachi sandals. His hair, like he just got out of the waves. Well, this is, this is the glorified Christ. This is the Christ. This is what Jesus looks like right now in heaven. This is awesome. Remember that when you pray. <laughs> Remember that when you're in trouble. So out of his mouth, a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Verse 17. And when I saw him, John said, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said to me, do not be afraid. Here it comes. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write these things. Watch this. Write the things which, number one, you have seen. Number two, the things which are. And number three, the things which shall take place after this. You notice that? The book of Revelation, by the way, gives its outline. The only book in the Bible that gives its own outline at the beginning. The things that were, the things that are, and the things that shall be. Church, there are things that have been, there's things that are happening now, and there's things that are going to happen all according to God's perfect plan. One more shot here on this one. Revelation chapter 22, verse 18. Revelation 22, 18. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of, uh, this, of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life. You don't mess with the Bible. So I want to have your eyes go to the screen right now to remind you. These pilots are, are not only trained observers, but they are some of the best aircraft pilots on the planet, operating some of the most sophisticated weapon systems on the planet. When they're telling you that they are encountering something that they cannot describe, that impacts our national security and our ability to respond to a perceived threat. And so when they are encountering these objects, we have to take their testimony seriously. Imagine something that had the ability to fly in space, underwater, and in our atmosphere at 13,000 miles an hour and, and change directions instantly. We fly the SR-71 at 3,200 miles an hour. If you wanted to take a right-hand turn, it would take you roughly half the state of Ohio to do it. 
And yet what we are seeing are objects that can do 90 degree turns instantly. And we're not talking about speeds of 3,200 miles an hour. They've been, been clocked at over 13,000. The question arises, how is that possible? That's not the voice of some pastor. That guy is not some Christian. That guy is not some uh, kook. That guy has been working until recently for the CIA. And what he has been observing, uh, he can't keep quiet anymore. And so he, among others, have become what you're watching now on the news and around the world is the whistleblowers of this argument regarding the phenomenon of things that are undescribable in our world today. And over the course of the last three weeks, these reports have been escalating all around the world. And so we began to talk about it last week, and we had to announce it for what it really is. Because there are scientists and there are physicists that are telling us that what people are seeing now does not match the physics of our known universe. So what's happening? And you just saw this CIA uh, agent talk about, in his investigation of unidentified atmospheric phenomenon, is what they're called, that the data shows from airline pilots, commercial pilots, private pilots, that they've seen these things happening and moving, going in and out of the ocean, uh, appearing, disappearing, with no apparent physical properties. So what, what are we going to say about this? Well, I can tell you what the world is saying about it right now. The world is saying, we, we're, we're, we're not alone. That's, the, that's what the world is saying right now. We're not alone. Well, we've never been alone, people. I want you to know that. We've never been alone. Uh, and people are saying, well, we, just, we saw this and we saw that. And there's the, uh, the Las Vegas reports right now. There's the New Mexico reports that are... Uh, in fact, it's been kind of weird. Some of these, they came out, we saw them, and then three hours later, we can't find them on the internet. We found them, though, in other countries, uh, and we've put those links away. We've preserved them, but uh, what's going on? Well, the point is this. These things are too fantastic. And, and wait a minute, I'm a Christian, and if you start talking about little green men flying around and doing circles around the FSR 71, which is the fastest thing we got going on, I can't explain that, and so I'm going to put my head back in the hole. I don't want to hear about it. Well, wait, 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 wait. Listen, first of all, who said anything about little green men? We're going to be talking and picking it up where we left off last week, that Jesus said, in the last days, there's going to be profound deception that is going to be launched against this world, and people will be deceived. I believe that we are seeing an age now that is swung like, it, as it were, a door wide open, and there's demonic manifestations that are taking place, and they are escalating. And when you look at history past, the conduct of the nations, the conduct of humanity, the way that we're thinking now in light of the past regarding satanic manifestations, demon possession, and strange things that cannot be described, everything biblically is coming together. If you don't have the Bible right now to explain these things, you are going to freak out. So what really bums me out is that when somebody's holding a Bible and says, I can't deal with this stuff, what are you saying? What are you saying about that book that you're holding? Jesus said there's going to be absolute radical deception in the last days. And so now the world is watching testimony from those that were abo aboard the USS Nimitz. It was also with the USS Princeton providing radar and guidance and protection when these UAPs began to appear just off the coast of San Diego. And in last week's message, I played numerous whistleblowers that have come forward from the United States Air Force as well as the United States Space Force as well as the United States Navy. And what they said was that they witnessed, tracked, and recorded, quote, unknown, non-physical phenomenon possessing unnatural flight characteristics, a term that they now have put unidentified aerial phenomenon or atmospheric phenomenon. It's happening now, being reported more in Russia and in England. 
is that makes you a little bit nervous, that's okay, calm down, write this verse down. Ephesians 6 verse 12 says, for we do not wrestle, we do not war against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Invisible demonic activity manifesting. How can a Christian have a problem with that when it's in the Bible? See, we don't want to hear this because we don't want to believe this because if it's, if it's true, now we've got something to deal with. I tell you what, Jesus is coming back and he's getting his church ready and things like this cause people to grab onto their Bible more or to run away from it. Listen, I think we're waking up to an age, everybody, where we have for far too long as a nation uh, been living among, re- living among recreational Christianity. I'll be a Christian so long as it serves me. I'll be a Christian so long as it's comfortable. I'll be a Christian so long as it's easy. I'll be a Christian so long as I can explain everything your way. And yet all the while, the Bible has given us the answers. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Church family, please think from this moment forward, Think more spiritually minded than ever before. Think more about the world that really is. And it's not the one that you and I spend so much attention on. And when the Bible says pulling down strongholds, you're not going to want to hear this. The pulling down of strongholds is a term that Paul the Apostle gave to the Corinthians. And he lifted it from the Old Testament to pull down strongholds. Some of you who know your Bibles, you are already framing The proper understanding of this. To pull down strongholds, the Old Testament showed us that, for example, when King Josiah came into power, or for that matter, Nehemiah. Nehemiah wasn't even a king. But what happened? They began to tear down the strongholds of the pagan worship systems that had encroached or invaded the land of Israel, the promised land. And what they did was, when a godly king or when a godly judge like Deborah, you got to love her, when they came to power, they pulled down the strongholds of Astroth, Moloch, Remphan, the various pagan gods, the Astroth poles. Have you, have you read that in your Bible, everybody? Ishtar? You know, you know the word Easter? Easter is from Ishtar. Eshtar is an, an incredible ancient deity. Eshtar, one of the chief deities of Babylonianism and the worship system. And they erected these gigantic, I'm looking around for, is there any young people in here? How, how about this? Uh, to tear down the high places. Have you ever heard that term in your Bible? To tear down the high places. The high place was a very large erect You know what I mean? Part of the human anatomy where they would gather together at the base of it and worship in the name of that God. And when God's people came into power, God told them, tear those things down. And uh, when Paul says tear down strongholds, he's talking about tear down falsehoods and lies that come against the truth. Now you think about that. You let that settle in for a moment. And you have to, when you read the Bible, you gotta, you don't speak to the Bible. The Bible speaks to you. And you gotta ask the, you gotta ask the scriptures. You gotta ask the Lord, Lord, is there any strongholds in my life that needs to be torn down? The Bible says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They won't listen to the Bible. There's a time when people, and I believe, as I said last week, that time is now upon us, where the Bible is considered a joke, a myth, and yet it is the very truth given by God to us. Why? Why are people saying this? Because people are believing the lies. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, are you guys okay? I'm just getting started, so write small in your notes. You guys, you know you can download the notes before service. Do you guys all know that? Okay, good. You're right there. See that? So you can see all the mistakes I make. It's all written down. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 tells us, Now the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, expressly says in latter times. That's the end of days. The Jews call it the end of days. We say the last days. Some will depart, that is, give up or transfer their faith away. Some will depart from the faith, 
giving heed. Listen, they give up on Jesus, but they give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Friends, this is so serious. I could actually stop right here and do the rest of the morning on that warning right there. In the last days, demons are going to deliver doctrine. You know what the word uh, for doctrine, it's a fancy word, doctrine. It simply means teachings. Demons are going to start teaching people in the last days. I'm not making it up. It's what the Bible says, and people don't want to hear it. That's just the first wave of getting into the last days. Demons are somehow going to be given the opportunity, the open door, I don't know. But there's something about the last days that kicks off an opportunity for demons to teach false doctrine and deceiving spirits. Deceiving spirits. A, a, a dark, demonic, invisible spirit that is able to deceive people by what is said or by what is done. And church family, if there was somebody that appeared tomorrow down the street speaking about spiritual things but doing profound miracles, I would venture to say that this church could be half the size of what it is today by next week if you follow the biblical example because Jesus himself even turned to the disciples and said, will you also go away? People want to see stuff. And if you have a need and a deceiving spirit empowered by the doctrines of demons teach a different gospel and a different Jesus with the power of satanic miracles, the Bible talks about satanic miracles, lying signs and wonders, the Bible calls it, how many people will go after that false teacher. They'll say, we don't care about the false teaching. We want the miracles. And that is how your fate is sealed. The only way that you can be safe against a deceiving future and a deceptive now is to know the word of God. And frankly, to address the things that are going on right now. Everything. Go look at it later. Here's your homework. Go look. Google things like this. Not now. Google things like this. Harvard professor uh, announces that Jesus Christ is an alien. And he goes through it. And he's Jewish. That's what's amazing. He doesn't recognize Jesus. And then the UFO thing comes down and he goes, that's it. Now I got it. Jesus is for real. He's an alien. (laughs) Google it later. Look at it later. Read him. Listen to him later. Just, it's all over the place right now. And all this has been coming out in the last couple of weeks. Tremendously. Deceiving spirits have always plagued mankind from the beginning. Need I mention to you, apparently, well, not apparently, we know that that Satan and the fallen angels fell some point prior to Adam and Eve being formed. Because we know that Adam and Eve, once they were formed, it wasn't long, we don't know how long, it wasn't long, it seems as though that Satan came and visited Eve in the form of a serpent. Now, this is what's hilarious to me. The form of a serpent. None of us know what that means. We think of serpents today. But what that serpent was back then, you have no, nobody has any idea what it was. It was called a serpent, but Satan possessed it. Apparently, it could talk. Because when it spoke to Eve, Eve didn't think that was a weird thing. Look, she wasn't stupid. She was perfect. Whatever it was, it's called the serpent. Did it fly? Did it walk? We don't know. All we know is that a serpent in its judgment was cursed to crawl on its belly. That's all we know. By the way, there's some goofball uh, English teacher that's trying to teach the book of Genesis, and he makes fun of the Bible saying about a serpent being condemned to crawl on its stomach. Doesn't everybody know that that's what serpents do is crawl on their stomach? Yeah, exactly. What kind of a dumb statement is that? The curse was, it was condemned to crawl on its stomach. So whatever Satan was, when the serpent spoke, Eve thought it was okay. And he deceived her. And if Eve can be deceived by the tactics of the enemy, so could any one of us. Apart from the Holy Spirit, that is. Using the word of God in your life. 
I believe Jesus Christ could come back today. I'm a premillennialist. If you're breaking it down in a seminary structure, I'm a futurist, premillennialist, pre-tribulationist, literalist. I believe in the Bible. Literally, I believe that Christ could come at any time. I believe that there's a distinct uh, difference between Israel and the church. Amen. And um, having said that, uh, we look at all the things that are going around in the world and we say, my, my goodness, we st we're starting to see things that are, that are representative of the second coming of Christ at the end of the tribulation period. So if we see things in this globe, in this world, where strange things are beginning to manifest, then how much closer are we to the rapture of the church? i got to tell you, I'm going to show you a picture. I took this yesterday. <laughs> you, anybody know where this is? It's where all, exactly, it's where all Christians spend their money. Uh, that's Hobby Lobby, yesterday. Excuse me, what? It's summer, people. It's summer. They just jumped right into Christmas. What is, Merry Christmas. What, is, what does this mean? What does this mean to us? Listen, if they're displaying Christmas stuff, then we know that Halloween's really close. Do you see the logic? If we're starting to see weird stuff going on, cashless society, one global government, one ruling power to bring everybody under submission to the order of one. By the way, look at the World Health Organization's teaming up now with the World Economic Forum and see what they have in store for you soon. If we see this stuff coming together now, then Thanksgiving's close. In other words, the rapture's close. Amen. He could come at any time. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for him? And then finally, listen, Luke 21, 28 says, Now Jesus said, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Notice that. When they begin to happen, woo, be looking up. So church, our second argument is this. By the way, this was only supposed to be a one Sunday teaching. It turned out to be two. I hope it's only two. But we'll see, how, let's, we'll see how many people leave today. And if, that's, if I'm on a trend, let's just keep going until only the saints are left, right? Uh, and, and we'll be okay. Point number two, what has the world observed in times past? That's one of the indica indicators. Luke chapter 17, verse 22. And he, Jesus, said to the disciples, listen up, everyone. The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man. You're going to desire to have me back, and you'll not see it. They will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them, says Jesus. Verse 24, for as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven and shines to the other part of heaven, he's talking about the second coming, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. That's when he comes to Jerusalem at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man, speaking of himself. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark because they thought it was a joke. That Noah was a joke. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, notice verse 30. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man, that's Jesus Christ, is revealed. Again, the reference not to the rapture, but to the second coming. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, watch out for these things. And there are two key warnings. Are you guys awake? Yes. There's two key warnings. As it was in the days of Noah, and like it was in the days of Lot. If you know anything about your Bible, those are horrifically demonized, charged, horrific times dangerous the history books are full of the conduct of that epoch of time 
with the most bizarre worship systems, paganism, paganism that you couldn't handle. If I were to say to you right now what I know about what a priest or priestess did at the temple of the nymphs, you would get up and run out of this place because you, I would be spewing pornography. And you would be correct. If I were to tell you what the worship practices are from ancient manuscripts of the worship of Ishtar, Easter, the worship of Ishtar, the goddess, you would turn red, blushing. If you think, by the way, listen, if you think gender changing is new, you're wrong. You need to know history. The Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, in paganism, they practice this stuff where you would literally be able to determine your gender at any given time and you would dress accordingly. Did you know that? Did you think this stuff's new? What you're hearing, it's not new. If that whets your appetite, you can go research this more and more. It's there. My point is this. In the days of Noah, the Bible says that men's thoughts were evil continually. In the days of Noah, children were sacrificed wholesale. In the days of Noah, man was living as though he were an animal. In the days of Noah, there was evil that Jesus said would not exist again until the time of the end. And I would submit to you that we are nearing those days. To understand where we are going, friends, we've got to look at the past. There's no other way around it. I mean, God help our public school system. If you want your kids to be smart, teach them history. Seriously. Amen. But I should, I should preface that. We, the best teachers at a school need to be history teachers. You can put all the boring teachers in the math class or something. <laughs> but history should be taught as passionately as it's revealed. Amen. History is amazing. It's a window into another world so that you can learn about what they did or didn't do that you know what to do or not do. History. But there seems to be a war on history today. Then listen, now we go into um, times of deception that were deceiving then and deceiving now. And I hope you can handle this. Job chapter 38, beginning at verse 3. Job 38, 3. You guys ready? Good, six of us are ready. Here we go. God says to Job, I love this, <laughs> poor Job, like he hadn't had it bad enough. Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you will answer, or you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? God's talking to Job. Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? I wonder if God paused right there. Uncomfortable. <laughs> Tell me if you understand. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Oh, this is God laying it on pretty hard. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Mark in your Bibles, the sons of God are angels. The entire Old Testament says the sons of God, God were angels. When God created everything, the angels and the morning stars sang. God creates and they sing and applaud the angelic realm. Everybody okay? You tracking with me? The word here for sons of God is this Hebrew word, benai eh Elohim. Benai eh Elohim, angels of God. Sons of God, angels of God. Fast forward. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 9. The prophet speaks under the influence of God. God is letting us into a window of the past. Hell from beneath is excited about you to meet you at your coming. It stirs up the dead for you. All the chief ones of the earth, it has raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. Okay, so somebody's going to hell, 
And God is saying, hell is getting excited about your arrival. Whoever this is, they're known in hell before they even get there. They shall speak to you and say, have you also become as weak as we? Have you become like us? Your pomp is brought down to Sheol, hell, and the sound of your stringed instruments, the maggot is spread under you, the worms cover you? How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. Can you believe this is in your Bible, everybody? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation of the furthest sides of the north. That's the supreme place. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Do you hear him? This is Satan. His name was Lucifer. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to hell, to the lowest depths of the pit. He was among the sons of God. He was an angelic creation. You connect this with Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13. Listen, this is eerie. Ezekiel. So we're talking 2,000, hang on. About 2,600 years ago. You were in Eden. The garden of God. Excuse me, who what? Every precious stone was your covering. Well, we're definitely not talking about Adam and Eve. They didn't wear stones. The sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub. Who covers the one with authority? I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in your hearts or found in you. Who, is, who are we talking about? Lucifer, Satan, the devil, an angel fallen, great power, archangel. Remarkable. The chronology of this, keep in mind now. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. And all of this, by the way, let me insert this in case you're just jumping in from somewhere. We're talking about deception in the last days, and we're answering the last days deception will no doubt include unexplainable things, unexplainable phenomenon, whether they are flying or under the water, whether they manifest or not, Maybe even technology, maybe even AI, unexplainable things are all part of or will be used by the great grand deception of the days of deception. Now it came to pass when men, that is man, us, mankind, began to multiply on the face of the earth, this gets weird, and daughters were born to them. Stop right there. You can't have men, mankind, replicating unless you have male and female. Got that? I mean, I know that sounds shock, but <laughs> you've got to have a male and a female to make a culture, to make a civilization. You, to propagate, you have to have a male and a female to make babies. This, this had been going on for a long time. Something, watch everybody, something in the narrative changes. Something goes strange. In other words, life's been going on. And daughters were born to them. Duh. Well, verse 2 says that the sons of God saw the daughters of man or mankind, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, this is the result, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh Yet his day shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward. When the sons of God came into, I'm not going to say the word, 
you know it. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown, says the scripture. Is this weird? As we look at this right now, watch this, everybody. I'll, I'll walk it through. Verse 1, now when it came to pass, when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, daughters, completely normal. However, when it mentions it, something's up. This is normal, but why are you calling out upon daughters? Daughters were born to them. Yes, yes, but there's a, something's changed. There's something different happening. Whatever's going on with the daughters of mankind, the women, there's been a change. They're, they're, they're either acting different, something's different, something's up. Things are not the same. That they were beautiful. The word beautiful here means that they went to great lengths to endow themselves. Can you believe this? This is Genesis 6. They went and it, it, the word implies that they heaped up uh, tremendous amounts of, of uh, eye-stimulating procedures. Maybe it's makeup, maybe it's wardrobe, we don't know. But there's an attempt among the daughters of men to go beyond their God-given beauty to enhance their beauty. They're doing something. So that when the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took, the word in Hebrew here, to take, is to seize them, capture them, to control them, jumped upon them, so to speak, took wives for themselves. See the word wives? It doesn't mean I take, I take the weird thing to be my husband. The word wives here is a very gentle way that the Bible is saying intercourse. Something really wild going on here. See, well, what's wrong with that? Um, nothing when it's in the right context. In fact, designed by God when it's in the right context. Took for themselves wives of all whom they chose. The word chose in Hebrew means that brought them arousal. Write it down. That brought them arousal. This is weird. Whoever the sons of God are, we know now, they're angels, benign and Elohim. The fallen ones that fell... The Bible tells us that when Satan fell, he took one-third of the angels with him in deception. When these fallen angels saw women conducting themselves in an extraordinary or outside the boundaries of sexuality, they seized upon them and cohabitated with them. Not demons, angels. Big difference. Big difference. You see, Jack, that's just that's crazy. Um, I'm reading to you the Bible, people. And I'm bringing it up because Jesus said, know the future as it was in the days of Noah. Can you believe that? Listen up. You think this is weird? Apparently weirder is coming. Uh, where, where was I? Where did I stop? Chose. Verse 3. And the Lord said, look at Now, because of what happened, God issues a judgment. That's it. Longevity shortened to 120 years. Look at the result. Verse 4. There were giants on the earth in those days. This is before the flood. Giants. By the way, look this up. Is there archaeological evidence of ancient giants? Go look that up. Does Israel have on display in their museums giant sarcophagus, giant implements, warfare, spears of massive size? I'm just... I'm not going to tell you the answer to that. You have to go look. You see, we're having, to real, we're, we're having to wake up right now to believe all of our Bible and our entire Bible and nothing but the Bible. We just have to be careful in how we read. So there were giants on the earth in those days, and this is troublesome, and also afterward. So, Jack, you say there's giants in the land after the flood? Did David confront the giant? Wasn't David way after the flood? Interesting, huh? How come? Boy, what's going on? There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when? When? Or how could this be? How's, how does this happen? 
when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. It's repeated. And bore them children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Men, not normal. When you study the men of renown throughout your Bible, just the Bible, you, how many toes do they have, the Bible says? You know, the Bible tells you how many toes these guys had. Six, 12 total. Six on each foot. How many fingers did they have? Six on each hand. Did you know this? Some of you just walked in here from some church that never opened the Bible. You're like... <laughs> and I would. I mean, I'm trying to be as gentle as possible here. But it's all in line with the coming deception. And if you have the Word of God in your heart, you'll identify it. You'll know it. Which, by the way, I pray that the rapture happens today and we'll not have to care anything about this nor go to Sacramento tomorrow. <laughs> Please, God, come today. <laughs> so the word giant, the etymology in linguistics is the word Nephilim. You ever heard of them? Yes. Now you know. The word Nephilim in Hebrew means the fallen ones. So the giants were not just Shaquille O'Neal type of guys. By the way, according to, according to what we know from the Bible, Shaquille O'Neal was a little guy compared to them. Imagine Shaquille O'Neal at seven feet tall. Goliath is at nine feet six. Fallen ones. In your Bible, write this down. Maybe we can put it on the screens, guys. I, I'm, I didn't prep you on this, but... Um, they're known as, uh, well, they're not only known as, but there's different types of. The Raphaim, the Nephilim, the Arba, the Zuzim, the Karnaim, the Imim, and the Anakim. All of these are races of giants found in the Bible, and the Bible says they're giants. In fact, the Bible tells us in other places, in 1 and 2 Samuel, that some of these men were so ferocious. In fact, imim, the imim, means the terrorizing ones. Imim, they were so spooky. The Bible tells us that in one day, Benaniah went on a day when it was snowing. I don't know why it says that. It just says, on a day that it was snowing, Ben and I went and fought two of the giants whose faces were like lions' faces. You see, Jack, I can't believe this. No, but we'll go to Hollywood tonight or we'll watch a movie in the theaters, Marvel, <laughs> Avengers, and, and eat popcorn and have a great time. I don't think you'll enjoy it so much now after realizing, oh man, this was based on at least ancient mythologies, but highly possible references of the scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 10. Deuteronomy 2, 10. The Bible says, Amim had dwelt there in times past, a people as great and as numerous and as tall as the Anakim. They were also regarded as giants like the Anakim, but the Moabites called them Emim. The Horites formerly dwelt in Seir, but the descendants of Esau dis dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their place just as Israel did to the land of their possession, which the Lord gave them. Do you guys realize this? Am I born, you guys? Is this, are you, is this, I feel, I'm excited about this. You're sitting so quiet. Do you remember when God told Joshua, now Joshua, when you cross over tomorrow, don't be afraid of those, don't be afraid of the people that are in the, in the land. Well, Joshua, remember they sent the spy reconnaissance team over, Moses sent the 12, remember? He sends the 12 spies over, jo uh, uh, oh boy, Joshua and Caleb were of the 12, they go there and they're sneaking around and they come back and the report was this, no way are we going in, uh, no way are we crossing the Jordan River. Uh-uh, no way. Why? There's giants in the land. They're huge. We were like grasshoppers. And God bless Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb, they just, they said, you're correct. They are giants in the land. And we, and we, we do seem to be like grasshoppers to them. And with the Lord on, with, on our side, let's go get them. 
And, and those, they rolled up their sleeves, which is why I just did that, so that you'd remember. Those two guys said, let's go get them. Well, when they go into the land, listen, this is going to answer a question that your friends throw at you. When they go into the land, some of the places that the children of Israel invade, God says to them, now when you get there, I, I want you to kill them. And then I want you to burn all of their dwellings, burn their bodies, their wives, their children, and even their animals, burn it all. If any of you have ever been or in, or in science, biology, chemistry, if you're a nurse or a doctor or a researcher, you know something called autoclave. If you are going to destroy a virus or disease or sickness, you must burn it at temperatures that are extremely hot. Okay? Every hospital has got an autoclave department. You say, man, it's awful mean of God to destroy the children. Well, what do the donkeys do and all the animals? That's terrible. What you don't realize is you study your Bible and you find out that those cultures were cultures that were polluted by not only their worship systems, but many of them were in associations with the giants themselves. They were DNA hybrid freaks. And God says, you got to clean it all. We have a slide. I forgot what it is. Number seven. Oh, look at this. This is not Christian uh, news report. Evidence of biblical giants found in northern Israel. That's nothing new, by the way. It's just more and more is being discovered out of the earth. Now, remember, when Jesus said in Luke 17, 26, it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. Jude, in your New Testament, you can turn to the back of your Bible. Just before the book of Revelation, you have the book of Jude. Listen to this. Okay, if you haven't, got, if you haven't been tempted to leave the building, you will be now. <laughs> but I want to remind you, though you once knew this, <laughs> everybody knows this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt after destroyed those who did not believe, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain... The angels who did not keep their proper dwelling place but left their own abode. Scholars will tell you, by the way, that word abode means home or skin. He, God, has reserved an everlasting change under darkness for the judgment of the great day. How come? Wow. What's the big deal? Why are you picking on angels? As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in, in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after, look at the word, strange flesh. The word means unauthorized flesh, unsanctioned. Flesh you're not supposed to touch. Are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a weird passage of scripture. I'm almost done. I hear the clock coming in Genesis chapter 6 verse 9 the Bible says this is the genealogy of Noah Noah was a just man perfect in his generations Noah walked with God isn't that a sweet verse that's like a hallmark verse that's kind of cute I want you to circle the word perfect in your Bibles, and I want you to go research that. It means physically sound, physically complete, physically intact, untainted, unblemished, without, a, without defect. Noah was without defect. That's a weird thing to say about somebody. You are untainted. Why did God wash away all those in the flood? The Bible says for a lot of reasons, but one of them is there were giants in the land. But Noah, he's physically intact. Is it possible that Noah's DNA was not polluted by whatever was going on? Say, so how can you talk like that? I don't know. Call me crazy, but that's how people talk today. DNA engineering. 
experimentation? I wrote myself a note. Jack, <laughs> but, why, but why would such a freaky blockbuster Hollywood kind of thing happen for realsies? <laughs> for one reason, write it down. Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15, it's the greatest prophecy ever given in the Bible, period, number one greatest. In fact, under this prophecy, all prophecies must bow. God says, I will put enmity, warfare, he's speaking to Satan, between you and the woman, between her seed, which is, between your seed, that's, that's weird, listen, between your seed, Satan, listen, I'm going to put warfare between you and the woman, He's referring to Eve. Between your seed and her seed. Oh, well, now it's really crazy. Because the words both in Greek and Hebrew, this is in the Hebrew, but it's, it's also repeated again in the New Testament. Greek and Hebrew, it's sperma. Information. Seed. It's the same word used for a kernel of corn or of wheat. The information that is in the seed. I'm going to put warfare, Satan, between your progeny and her progeny. The difference is she gets a capital S and you don't. Do you see that? That verse promises a Messiah to come. Every Jew knew, knows this. Every Jew knew it. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Listen. The word, the word bruise, I don't know why the translators, the word bruise, if you look it up, the word means to crush. He will crush your heel. Satan is going to crush the heel of Jesus. Listen, church, this is a test. But he will crush your head. If something's got to be crushed in your life, would you rather pick your head or your heel? <laughs> Satan is going to inflict pain on you, Jesus, at the cross. That's okay. In, in that event, he's going to crush your head. Amen. <laughs> so church, I want to challenge you with this. Was Jesus really telling us the truth? Yes. That it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. Are you ready? Listen, yes, I do understand. But pastor, those, that's predominantly during the tribulation period. I understand that. You are theologically correct. But things are spooling up. People are seeing things traveling at 13,000 miles an hour and they're making 90 degree turns. Why? Because they're not from this world. And they're not physical either. They're demonic. Those are spirit creatures faking, pulling off ET narrative to get you to warm up to or to get people to think, oh, like we showed you last week, they're here for our good. But things are going really, really weird fast. Number three, I know we're over. We're going to end. We're going to end. What is the word, what, what is the world observing at this present, present time? And we'll end with this. Um, we're, at this present time, man is scrambling to make his last ditch effort to govern himself. And I think man has found out that he's not capable. And so he's inventing things uh, to do it for him. There's been a falling out between Elon Musk and one of his uh, IT, or excuse me, AI partners, uh, because Elon Musk said, I think we need to slow all this down. It's getting out of hand. We have crossed the Rubicon. It's too much. We have now, isn't this weird for me to be saying this at a time? Think about this. Elon Musk is saying, we've reached a point with artificial intelligence that if it gets out of the cage, we're doomed. Okay, that's weird, right? I want you to listen to what he says here about him and his buddy who are now warring over that fact. Can I ask you just about, since you've been around a lot of this, the thinking? So why would anyone not be a speciesist, be human-centered in his thinking about technology? Like, what's the thinking there? Um, I think what he's trying to say is that, um, if I were to guess, uh, that, he, that uh, all consciousness uh, should be treated uh, equally. Um, and whether that is digital or biological. Hmm. Scary statement right there. And you disagree? I disagree, yeah. 
um, especially if the uh, digital uh, consciousness or whatever you want to call it, digital intelligence uh, decides to curtail the biological intelligence. Right. So you're just building your own slave master, and why would you do that? Doesn't sound great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we should we, we should at least uh, we, no need to rush. You know, <laughs> look, what's the hurry? <laughs> Um, so what's the timeline here? At what point does it start to really change our society, do you think? I think it starts to have a, a, probably a, a, an impact this year. GPT-4, uh, now it's like writing poetry um, and... Pretty decent poetry, actually. Pretty decent. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, skill at rhyming is incredible. Yes. <laughs> yes. And it's coherent. Yes, it is. Uh, it, it's even got a narrative. Like, yes, so got that's a, right. Yeah. So you could say that's like- That's hard to do. Like most humans can't do that. That's true. So it's already past the point of what most humans can do. Uh, most humans cannot write as well as uh, uh, ChatGPT. Um, and they certainly, and, and no, no human can write that well that fast, as mm -hmm. the best of my knowledge. How can you have a democracy with technology? Here like you go. That? I mean, if democracy is you know, government by the people, each person's vote is equal to every other person's vote. I mean, and people are choosing their votes freely. Can you have a democracy with this? Well, that's why I raise the concern of um, AI being a significant influence in elections. Um, and, and even if you say that AI doesn't have agency, well, it's very likely that people will use the AI um, as a tool uh, in elections. Um, and then, it, you know, if the AI is smart enough, it, it, are they using the tool or is the tool using them? So I think things, things are getting weird, and they're getting weird fast. I think things are getting weird. I think they're getting weird fast. Now, I'm no, uh, I'm no Elon Musk, nor am I the richest man in the world, but he said something that you can shoot holes at in that interview. He talked about something that we've created, and he talked about our consciousness and its consciousness. Did you catch it? Yes. Friends, that's impossible. Consciousness. When Adam was laying in the dirt without life, God breathed in him, not only air into his lungs, but consciousness. You know, we could lay you wide open like a Christmas turkey and never find your consciousness. It is a God-given thing to all living things. How does an AI device, and he assumes it, that its consciousness should be treated as fairly as our consciousness. Because we're being prepared, or the world is being prepared, to receive a man who is going to have with him a, an assistant, the false prophet, the Bible calls him. He's going to say false things. And that false prophet's going to invent or going to display an AI device called the image of the beast. And the Bible says, I'm paraphrasing, I have to end. The Bible says that power will be given to it to both breathe and to speak. But it's not real. Consciousness apparently is the, is the deciding factor if we take it to the next step of deception. Let's end right here because we're out of time. How about this? What if the same demons that are manifesting these aerial phenomenon things can produce what looks like consciousness in a mechanical device. You have a level of deception placed upon the world that the world has never seen before. Some sort of a thing that can know all about you in nanoseconds of time. It can do mathematical equations at the, at the tap of a button. Listen, it even writes poetry. And it is so intelligent at writing po poetry that most humans do not compare to its poetic skills. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living in the days of deception. No Jesus Christ He's easily found in the word of God. Don't let anything substitute this book in your life.
Father, we pray, God, in Jesus' name, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, right now, from this sanctuary to the ends of the earth, that you would take this message, and God, that you would protect it, get it out there, cause people to think, to come to the conclusion that you've written us this book that has written history down in advance to announce Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's unrivaled, unchallenged, nothing compares to the one and only true God. No deception, no falsehood, no way. In Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray, all God's people said, Amen. Amen.